So how are we going to do this? I know we need, we're trying to make it 20 minutes, but again, let's make it 20 minutes, minutes if it's 20 minutes. I broke it down into five videos. It's about seven questions. But when we start getting into this, it's going to be, it's going to be tough not to uh, dig in because there's so many things where she's, it's suggesting she's being deceitful. There, I mean, what do you all think? Up front, we need to say, look, we just chose something like lighthearted because of all the heavy stuff. So we could still teach you about body language, but not be on such a serious topic. And what I'll do is when we introduce ourselves, then Greg, when it comes back to me, then I'll throw it back to you and say, Greg, why don't you explain what we're... we're I'm okay with that. Great. Okay. All right, everybody ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. I'm Scott Rouse, I'm a body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. I'm also a keynote speaker, and I'm focused right now in the healthcare sector. Chase? Hi, I'm Chase Hughes. I retired from the U.S. military and now develop programs and teach interrogation behavior profiling, and I am a trial consultant here in the United States. Mark? Hi there, I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, helping people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they speak, including some leaders of the G7. Excellent. Greg? I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator and interrogation resistance instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, including How to Spot a Liar, which will be handy today. And I work primarily in corporate America and Wall Street. Excellent. So, Greg, why don't you explain what we're doing? In this episode. Yeah, so today we thought we would take a break from all this heavy stuff and go to something more lighthearted. Still an opportunity to teach you how to tell when someone is deceiving you. And so we chose this time to look at someone who's abducted by aliens. We thought it'd be a great story. All right, let's get started. Before I sat down with Jane, she voluntarily sat a lie detector test or polygraph. She underwent this test three times. Have you been part of an alien breeding program? Yes. There are three important questions. Did you meet an alien? Do you have part alien children? Have you been part of an alien breeding program? No deception was indicated. So, As I would ex expect. All righty. Who wants to go first? Greg? Yeah, you, polygraphs anyway. You, a polygraph's as good as the person who's actually administering it. They're really interrogators with props, and we'll all talk about that one, I'm sure, today. But she's sitting there braced ready for whatever he's going to ask, her flutter of her eyelids as she starts into that thing. You can see she's gripping her chin drops to cover her throat. She's protecting vital organs. She's clearly affected by the fight or flight. And then my favorite is when they get to ask her or to say, you took this polygraph and she's waiting. She's braced again for the worst. You, you know, you're you not telling the truth. But instead they say you passed. Well, again, a polygraph is as good as a person administering. Excellent. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so three times on the polygraph, I, but no explanation as to why three times. I mean, is that standard procedure that you'll ask the same questions three times? Uh, was one time not so good for this show? And so they did it another couple of times and well, they got you know, maybe should get better at it. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, that moment of... Uh, as I would expect, and that slight stutter there, that jump in as I would expe expect, uh, I'm wondering whether she, there's something up there. Did she really expect that? Did she expect something else? Is, there, uh, is she caught a little bit off balance by this moment? Uh, also, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about the questions Three important questions. Uh, did you meet an alien? Do you have part alien children? Have you been part of an alien breeding program? Because what we'll find out later on is she considers alien and alien breeding maybe a little bit different from how we consider alien and alien breeding and how the audience might be expecting alien and alien breeding to be. I mean, if you frame the idea of what is an alien in a different way, then, you know, many of us have been part of alien breeding programs and, and have met aliens. So but maybe we'll come to that a little bit later. Well, we're okay. all Americans, so you know we fit. <laughs> I don't know your, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, Chase, I know you have uh, not just, an, uh, you know, a concept what's, or an idea of what's going on here, but what about, uh, tell us about your feelings about... Uh, lie detector test anyway. Yeah, polygraph is a perfect machine for detecting all deception. 
and I didn't mean that at all. <laughs> it is a machine that is a complete con. The entire machine is a con. Yep. So the guy that's operating the polygraph machine, hopefully, is a good interrogator who's got something, he's got a reason to ask questions. And later on, he's got a reason to go back to those questions and say, you said this and the polygraph machine said this. You've got to give me some more information. And if anybody in here, anybody watching, if you've got a top secret clearance or you've ever gone undergone a polygraph, they're going to tell you that you did bad pretty much every time. And that's in the textbook. And uh, uh, it's the biggest con game in the world. However, you could see the relief on this woman's face. You could see her bracing. She was rigid and frozen in place. And if you take a picture of someone who is completely honest, if I polygraph anybody and, and I'm asking you about a real event in your life, you're not going to be that nervous. You'll, you'll be open and you won't have that thing that Scott, the term that Scott coined, extra face. You're not going to have that feeling of I need to control and reserve everything. It's going to flow out. You're going to have confidence that you'll be doing pretty well in the polygraph. Excellent. One thing I noticed, and it just come from an interrogator's uh, point of view, when he's asking the questions, did you notice what he wasn't doing? Looking, looking at her. He wasn't looking at her. He was just at the question. Did you, did you have She will tell me. me. Yeah. So it's, it's like, you got to be kidding. So I don't know, it's somebody's cousin or something. They've said, dude, you can do that. You've got one of those. Yeah, I got the app. Come on in. Yeah. How's it work? I just, I plug them up and it works. It works every time, you know? So that's, that's the part. And they call it polygraph. That's what the woman keeps saying. But um, is that British, Mark? Is that, is that the way they no, think it? No, it should be polygraph. It should be polygraph. It's okay. the same. All right. Yeah. There is no polya. That is poly. Many. Okay. Many graphs, many meters, many. Yeah. It's a thing. <laughs> And it has many things that go like this on it. And, yeah. uh, you know, for most people, if they see a polygraph or they're hooked up to one, they're going to go, oh, 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 I better, I better comply right yeah. now. I, I, got, I got trouble. Yeah. And, and as Chase was saying, it's a great prop. It's a great tool to go, oh, well, you know, you weren't telling us something here and to dig in deeper. Well, it measures three things against baseline. Galvanic skin response, which means blood leaving your, your skin to go to, to fighting utensils to go to your arms and legs. It means respiration, and it means um, heart rate. That's the three things they're measuring, and those can be masked. So it's only as good. I, Chase, you and I are dead on with this one. It's as good as the person using it as a prop. A sharp stick might be just as good if you use it correctly. Before I sat down with Jane, she voluntarily sat a lie detector test, or polygraph. She underwent this test three times. Have you been part of an alien breeding program? Yes. There are three important questions. Did you meet an alien? Do you have part alien children? Have you been part of an alien breeding program? No deception was indicated. So, As I would ex expect. Here we go, here's a second. on this one. <laughs> Jane's first experience with aliens, or greys as she calls them, happened when she was a toddler. I was in a white painted cot and I pulled myself up and looked up into the beautiful eyes. I thought of him as the man with cow eyes at that age. Did he talk to you in English? In English, yes. In language I would understand, but telepathically, no sound. And I found instinctively that I could talk back to him the same way. It was just there. We went up into a spaceship. <laughs> It, well, no, we went into, if I think back then, rather as an adult looking back, we went into a brown silver room and I lay on a table that was cold and above me was pictures of my, I now know, pictures of my organs, but I had no idea what was going on. They were just things in the air. And I would now translate that or describe that as a hologram. Though at my age, I don't think holograms existed then. Okay. Chase, what do you got? This was great. She starts off with a very vivid description of the crib, a white painted crib. She's looking up in these big giant cow eyes and it's very visual. And this may be a real dream that she had. This is the most vivid description that she offers throughout the entire interview. 
And after she is saying each one of these little pieces of the story, she does something called a confirmation glance to make sure that the interviewer is still buying the story. And this nervous laughter at the end of each one of them, you notice that we didn't see that anywhere else. And we don't see it later on when she's not really emotional, not trying to sell anything. And the only honest part of this interview, in my opinion, is when she's talking about her own children, her real human children, not the human aliens. Okay. All right. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So to pick up on that, uh, there's that moment where she looks for approval on, we went up into a spaceship. She looks for approval. And because the interview here is hard as nails with her, my assumption is is she gets zero approval back and she instantly crumbles and produces that, that laughter in order to brush that aside and then do a rationalization of it and to say, well, you know, that's what, as an adult, I say it is. As a child, let me describe to you where I was, which sounds to me like some kind of doctor's office of some sort, a, 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 brown, a brown room with some lights and with some pictures of organs, <laughs> you know, kind of like you'd go if you went to a, a doctor's or a trainee doctor or, you know, any kind of medical place, you're probably going to see some of that. Some of that stuff. So uh, for me, there's an instant point here where I'm I'm really seeing some some crumbling (laughs) during the interrogation that's going on here. And really the interrogation here is for the interviewer to say nothing and just let her blurt out her story and start changing the story as she goes along. Excellent. Greg? Yeah. I, I'm with both of you. She rumble, rambles through stuff that no two-year-old could possibly remember. If this is something that's a vivid dream somewhere along the way, I think it's a little bit more than that. You know, people, if you think of Maslow's hierarchy, you get into belonging in a group and then differentiating. Once you tell your story and people start to stroke you and you keep making details and details and details, it gets more and more vivid. She's doing recall from the vivid portions of that. It's not a lot of visual recall of any kind. She's baselining pretty much the same every time she goes for a memory. But that could be rote. She's learned this thing over and over and over. And that giggling, that ha 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 is a way to try to socially bond when she's made a really big, goofy mistake. So, I mean, this is, a, this is textbook for watching someone who's lying to you. If I were interrogating someone sitting across the table and they had all of that behavior, I would immediately go to deception and rehearse deception. Excellent. I got a few things with this. Like when she's talking, it's the way she's saying it, the way she's talking about it. When she, when she, when she asks her, did he talk to you in English? She says, yes, English in a, in a language I would understand. She wouldn't say that I would understand. She'd say that I understood. Another thing is when she says, um, I found instinctively I could talk back um, the same way. Two-year-olds so she- don't have the cognitive ability to, to talk conceptually about things like instinct and those types of things. So that's what either, if she's being honest, then she's got her timeline wrong. She wasn't two. She was about seven or well, eight. Well, two, two, two years old, imagine what she said back to the alien. Bottle, cookie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she could yeah, have toy. Time. Yeah, exactly. So those, those are things right out of the gate that bother me. And it doesn't sound like things are in order either. You know, we'll get, we'll get to that in the, in the next setup. but. Things are already st- sounding kind of weird, like she's, like she's not being honest about it. I don't know how to don't say story. any better than that. Tell story. Jane's first experience with aliens, or greys as she calls them, happened when she was a toddler. I was in a white painted cot and I pulled myself up and looked up into the beautiful eyes. I thought of him as the man with cow eyes at that age. Did he talk to you in English? In English, yes. In language I would understand, but telepathically, no sound. And I found instinctively that I could talk back to him the same way. It was just there. We went up into a spaceship. <laughs> it, well, no, we went into, if I think back then, rather as an adult looking back, we went into a brown silver room and I lay on a table that was cold and above me was pictures of my, I now know, pictures of my organs, but I had no idea what was going on. They were just things in the air. 
and I would now translate that or describe that as a hologram. Though at my age, I don't think holograms existed then. Yeah. All right, everybody good? All good. Let's, all right, let's yep. move on. How long do you think you were away at this particular point in time? Didn't, didn't your mother miss you? Well, that's a good point. They definitely do something to us, as in the ab abductees, for want of another word, experiences. They either hypnotise us, either chemically or in some other way. I mean, we have a drug called midazolam on Earth. It's similar to only having a light dose of that. And mum just didn't wake up. And I think they do something to the, the people around you too. I might have only been gone 10 minutes. I have no idea. How, how do you tell time at that age? All right, Greg, what do you got? Well, first of all, how do you tell time at that age? Well, how do you know what hologram, all that stuff, everything that she just keeps bringing up. Again, accessing the same place consistently. Usually a good indicator if I'm asking you a question and you're running through it. There are a couple of other just stammers. My favorite is, that's a good point. That's anytime you're asking somebody and you got them on the ropes, they're looking for space. That's a great one. That's a distance. That's a give me time and space to be able to come up with something. She probably had never heard that question before. Case? I fully agree with Greg. And any of us, if, if our memory is so vivid that we can recall the silver room, the images floating, we'll remember some kind of time. I can ask you, how long was your 10th birthday? And you'll say, eh, a couple hours, 45 minutes or so, opened some presents and finished it up. And if the memory is so vivid that she remembers the skin and the eyes and the painted white crib and has no memory of about how long it took, which is even to provide an estimation or to, to qualify what she said afterwards. She had something in there called a qualifier where she gives an answer and then explains it away by means of something else. How can you tell time at that age? And she has a very unusual head turn with her eyes as soon as she says, well, how can you tell time at that age? She breaks contact from the interviewer with her skull and the eyes at the same time, which is horizontal gaze aversion. This is one of the pre-flight indicators that we teach to police officers before yep. somebody's about to run. Yep. Yep. That, but I didn't see that. I agree. And that part, you're right. But I didn't see the flare nostril, nostrils, which you'll see as well. A lot of times they'll, you'll see them looking and those nostrils will go up and then bang, they're gone. Yeah. You know? Mark, what do you got? Well, there's a <laughs> chemical in the brain called isopropin. And when isopropin is uh, imbued upon the negative ions, so that you see what she's doing is just throwing in the name of the chemical so that we'll all go, oh, okay, all right. Well, you're talking science then. So we'll just agree with that. That, that idea of... of Medazolim, which she which she puts in, which is a which is a, a drug. She'd understand. She's a nurse, so she she'd have come across that. And it seems she knows the effect of it as well. So she knows the short acting effect of it. It's quick acting, lasts for a short amount of time. So she understands that. But her hope is, I think, if she throws in that long word, the interviewer will comply. So again, it's another look for compliance. And you get that with people who are trying to string you a story all the time. Uh, they'll bring in they'll bring in things like you know, well, the funny thing is, or you know, try and make you laugh. Try and bring in uh, qualifiers that are of a higher status. Uh, I, I think it was one of one of you have talked about before. Read out their resume to you. I think this is the the bringing in of, of Medazolim at the moment is is kind of a resume that she's putting forward to say there's no point in questioning me. I understand about drugs. And also the story just gets confused at this point. I'm pretty smart and I couldn't work out for a, for a start whether she was talking about her or her mother. And she starts off talking about her and then brings it back to her mother. And so I'm, I'm, I'm confused. And I think it's a simple question, which is why didn't, why didn't somebody notice you were gone? Yeah. I mean, a good answer would be, I have no <laughs> idea. I just don't know. I don't know why. Dude. I don't know. Yeah. And if you're, I, was a, I was a baby. If you're going through an experience like midazolam and someone asks you about it or you're just talking about it, you'll describe the feeling. And, you know, writing fiction, I know there's a thing called showing versus telling. If I tell you somebody's confident 
That's, that does nothing for you. If I say she strode into the room and everybody turned around to look, it changes things. It changes how you, how you perceive the whole situation. But when we're telling a story, we're describing experience, not facts. We're saying, I, I got something. I felt a haze come over me. My whole body relaxed. And I remember just floating down into this table or sinking down into this alien table. Well, to that point, Chase, let's help her be a better liar, okay? If, that, if that's what's happening. Sure. A, 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 a better lie right off the, the bat, for example, when they say, well, you know, what did they say to you? would be to say it wasn't really language. It was, it was just a feeling. You just knew. I just knew what they were talking about. And, and it wasn't really a language. It was just an exchange of feeling. Yeah, the weird thing to me is most people will tell you to take facts and you expand them to create a good lie or a good story. She's just sprinkling a, a random fact in here that she happens to have because everything else is plain cloth, right? And when you talk about lies of, Omission commission. A lie of commission is the hardest to sustain because it has to tie into your life. And she just got called on the carpet for a big miss in that tying all of her all of her stuff together. Why didn't your mother miss you? And there will be another. She's going to get another one. This interviewer, at least, is not buying into this craziness, and that's yeah. kind of interesting. And her, and her questions aren't really that good. No, they're know? not. But but at least she's asking something instead yeah, of going, oh, that's really. True. That's true. One, th- one problem I had was she keeps separating herself from what's happening when she's talking about what, where did you, the, again, the story here, she talks about the drugs and then she gets to the time. I don't know how long it could have gone. It could have been 10 minutes. And when she's talking about these things, she says that when they, when they, they hypnotize us or when we do this, it's like she's part wants to be part of this group or she's, she's removing herself from it and saying it's us and we, it's not just me. It's a bunch of us, you know, and Pronounce doing it. this, yeah, you'd think there'd be some excitement if, like, uh, what Chase was saying about uh, des- describing something you'd see. If I had, if if I told you, look, there's, a, I saw a murder wasp, and it was like this long, and it was big, made a big buzzing sound, it came right at me. It, but it, in real life, I'd say, I said, man, I saw a damn murder wasp. The thing was huge. It was huge. If it gets on you, you're done. That's it. I've seen one of these things. It's got, the stinger's got to be that long. Hand of God, I couldn't, be- I could not believe what I was seeing. There's none of that in there. She's not saying anything. That she's telling a story. Excited. She's telling a story. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's again, and that and everything being out of order. You know, the thing the thing she should have said last was one of the first things she's talking about. And then she gets to where the time goes away. She's not not answering the question, or maybe she's told this so many times she has to get those points in. Did she say she was writing a book or anything in this? Did we know that? Oh yeah, right at the end. Yeah, she, right oh, at the end. Oh yeah, yeah. You're right. She does. Right at the yeah, very. She end. does. Okay. Uh, there's a book in it. Okay. Okay. By the yeah. way, my, my cousin Dave, he was abducted by a murder wasp. Truth. Oh, my God. I'd love to hear that God's story. Honest. You need to bring him on. Were you, were you there? I'll, I'll, yeah. <laughs> abducted, murder wasp. Did he, <laughs> he wasn't part of a Hugh Mosp program. <laughs> was, Don't mock interesting. him. Interesting. Was, was, was he, he mocking hunting him. when cool. he found it? <laughs> he, was, he was hunting with his mate. Hunting Bigfoots, probably. Yeah. I'd say. Mad Derek. Him and his mate, Mad Derek, were out hunting. <laughs> How long do you think you were away at this particular point in time? Didn't, didn't your mother miss you? Well, that's a good point. They definitely do something to us, as in the ab- abductees, for want of another word, experiences. They either hypnotise us, either chemically or in some other way. I mean, we have a drug called midazolam on Earth. It's similar to only having a light dose of that. And mum just didn't wake up. And I think they do something to the, the people around you too. I might have only been gone 10 minutes. I have no idea. How, how do you tell time at that age? All right, everybody good? Good. Yeah. Oh, good. You go. Do you have part alien children? Yes. You claim to be the mother of three hybrid children, humanians. Yes. So how were they conceived? They were conceived in the usual way. Both the human father and I probably have some alien DNA already in us. And then at about 12 weeks, I was taken up into the spaceship again. I have a clear memory of this. So that's where you had sex too, wasn't yes. it, in the spaceship? Yes. yes. So, so you... A lot of people might make a joke about the no, wildlife can... club. <laughs> <laughs> All the children were conceived on the spaceship? Yes. Did you have any say in that? No. 
No, and you know, I'm making the best of this story and I'm trying to be lighthearted about it because I've been through my grieving process and I still have days I'm upset about it and I miss the children. So I say they were kind to me and they consented and I want to defend the race because I feel part, almost part of them as if they're family. Where did you give birth? Well, the, the, they were taken from my uterus in the spaceship, but here I had to have DNCs and there was no... Curious. Yes. Um, so and doctors so, were confused every time. So they, they they removed the babies here. No, they removed the babies in their and hospital. Then you had to, and then you had to spaceship. go to hospital to have a bit of treatment. Well, I did. Yes, I could. So did so you you only went to a three month term or something like that. The, the longest baby? one was five months. And then the babies yeah. were put into some sort of test, some sort of humidity crit or something, something in space? Yeah. They've got way more advanced medical technology than we do. There's no question about that. But here I would have an ultrasound and there would be a fetus on the ultrasound and I would have positive pregnancy tests and then suddenly the baby would be gone without any evidence of that. <laughs> but if you glue. carried a baby for five months, someone must have noticed you were pregnant. Oh no, I went to a doctor and it was confirmed that I was well, pregnant. Where was your husband? I um, your earth husband. I was divorced <laughs> by you the were state. Divorced by yes. It. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else wondering if she had, if she was confirmed pregnant with three kids that disappeared, where the hell those kids are? Uh, that sounds, that's like some kind of trauma thing must have happened if that was true, number two. And number one, the, the cops would be there. You know, yeah, you have well, that's what kids. I'm thinking. Well, yeah, yeah I, don't think it's down, I don't think it's down that route, but certainly we've oh, got somebody here who, 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 um, who is, you know, to, to look at it in its best light, which is this is made with this. If it isn't somebody who's just written a book and trying to promote it, what we have here, somebody is, is traumatized. Right. And in order to deal with that trauma, they've created uh, a story of these children being abducted by aliens, much like in, in medieval times. Uh, if you had kids who uh, were going to be a bit of a problem for you, you took them out into the woods and the fairies would get them and they'd turn them into changelings. Uh, there was always, there was a supernatural way of dealing with some of the tragedies of, of life, which is losing children or purposely losing them. I don't think that's what's happened in, in this case, uh, but certainly we've got somebody here who understands uh, DNC and understands probably what is either, either stillborn or or certainly miscarriage, and is trying to deal with that situation by creating a story. Yeah, or, or just making up a story, as you said in the beginning. But more importantly to me, this is an Occam's Razor kind of thing, right? If, if a person told me that I had alien babies, and this happened, this happened, this happened, if people knew you were pregnant and suddenly you just showed up and said, hey, the babies are gone, don't you think you'd start to see a trend in that person over time? So it could just be a plain cloth story. Her friends, the people around her would start asking questions. All these people around would start to wonder. I'm just saying, imagine today a woman you know who lives next door who is pregnant and at five, five months pregnant. Every time the baby disappears, what do you think would happen in real life? Yeah, I can Somebody say would be on the phone sure. and, hey, guys, something's going on with this woman. It, and maybe she lives in, you know, somewhere where that doesn't happen. But just ask yourself as you're talking to someone who has an outlandish story, is that real or practical? Can that have happened and no one have noticed? And this woman is starting, the, the interviewer is starting down that path. There's just some outlandish things. Never mind that she is in a heightened sense of fight or flight looking for the door with her body in more than one direction. She's doing posture shifts. She's shuffling. She's covering my army days we would have called that covering your blowhole mm -hmm. there's the super all, sternal I, notch i think we gotta start notch, yeah. I, I think we gotta call that the navarro notch he's the one that was sort of popularized <laughs> yeah, yeah. that yeah yeah yeah, you know? yeah. But anyway it's, and also there when she's as she's talking about it she's uh she's she has no emotions when she's talking about the kids it's all the same emotion the whole time and they usually i always talk about the loping greg and i uh, i sent Greg, a recording of, of a thing I'm, I'm working on, and yeah. the person in question, their story is just loping right along and everything sounds fine. In this one, it's all choppy and stops. And, and when she hits that super sternal notch or the Navarro notch, she's I think she's trying to just blast right past that 
what happened to the kids? What, what happened to you? How long were you in the hospital? What was going on? What are you talking well, about? Well, I, th I think that hits on the hospital. I think the problem here is the hospital. I think the problem here is what, what has happened to her or she's deciding has happened to her in a hospital. Hmm. That's the hospital. Okay. Of it. Chase, what do you got? So a DNC is a procedure to basically clean out the inside of the uterus after a miscarriage and abortion. And that's pretty telling that, that somebody would say that. And if I was making up a story and I know that those are in my medical records, I'll make that part of the story just in case that ever comes up. I will add that, make sure that that evidence that's real and findable is part of the story. And this very much could be traumagenic. This entire thing could be based in trauma. But you see, as, as she's getting pressed on any of these questions, if any of us are getting pressed on a major event in our lives, we're relaxed, we're open, our face is moving, our tone of voice is changing, we're showing emotion. If we're talking about losing a child, dear God, we're going to show some emotion. That's, mm. There's nothing worse. And, and we see nothing here. So we're, she's kind of parading this, this story out, and you see as she gets closer to this part of the story that makes her nervous, she's reaching up, covering the neck, protecting the throat, and goes down here and starts doing jewelry playing. Women are more likely than men to associate jewelry with identity, and this is one of those things where you see jewelry playing and you see this, this nervousness towards the end of the statement. Chase, great catch, and it's not just jewelry. Do you notice what it is? Oh, yeah. Yeah, a cross, right? That's oh, yeah. a barrier of a kind that I always say, holy relics, bear, you know, clothing that you wear. You know, some religions wear specific things, and that cross is a huge, huge thing to touch. It's reemphasizing. It's outsider clothes for a reason. I mean, all of that. So, yeah, yeah it, you could put a, a generator on her body and create some electricity from her moving around so much in this yeah. thing. So here, here's what I'd say is, 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 Chase, I think you're right that we don't see emotion here, but what we do see is a story about being abducted by aliens. And so what I think we're seeing here is the transference of that emotion into an incredible story and into a situation where you would go on telev television and, and you would, uh, you would t retell that fantasy. You would be prepared to do that. So we aren't seeing a woman who's, um, you know, weeping over her children. We're seeing her, probably from most of our point of views, telling a mad story. Uh, and this is, there's a history of this. I mean, back in London, there was a place called Bedlam, and in the Victorian times, you could pay to go and watch mad people. And now we have entertainments like The X Factor, where you can just, you know, watch people who are delusional around the talent that they may or may not have. Here, I, I suspect we have somebody, you know, with the best will in the world, probably what we have is, is somebody who could be delusional, or they're promoting a book, but they could be delusional. They could have created this world in order to deal with the trauma and we've seen that throughout history because we get the idea of hysteria from it which comes from the the goddess hestia which was the goddess of the woman's reproductive organs and what people have found over time is that around trauma around female reproductive organs there is a huge amount of energy and emotion which can be turned into what people then called a madness and you could go and watch people enact that madness. Did anybody oh, catch the, the part where she says, uh, so I say they were kind to me and they consented. What are they consent, consenting to? Did you hear that part? Yeah. I think she's yeah, beginning to refer to, to her reframing the story to the point where she consented to the sexual activity with the aliens. But she That's says they consented. It, you're right, right. It's confusing. It gets very, very confused yeah. and given she's written a book why is she so why is she so confused about telling the story it must be it must be written down in some kind of way that's intelligible and here it's all over the shop well, i think what's happening with her here is she comes in with a plan and like most good plans it goes to hell when she starts to get some pressure and then her little brain takes over and her big brain goes to sleep 
and she's back into that cat brain running around like a squirrel in the road because she doesn't know where to go next. And she's grasping at little pieces of the story as she pulls it forward. That's why it's out of sequence. When you interrogate, you, you guys, I know have seen this. You get a person who has a grand story and a good framework and you pull on the right string in the sweater and the sleeve and falls off and they're grabbing at the sleeve and trying to hold on to their story because it's not sustainable. It's not in the rhythm they plant and they come apart. It's the best technique in interrogation. She's, she's also, once again, trying to be part of a group because when she says, I thought of them, I think of them as family. That's why I defend them, you know, as if they're family. She's trying to make herself part of something. I don't know if that's a psychological thing where she's not part of any groups. Maybe nobody likes her. She's, you know, that situation going on. And she tries to keep saying us and we and family and I'm having kids and all these things going on. Because in a few minutes, she's going to be talking about how she's divorced. So I don't, it sounds like, I, I think a lot of it sounds, if we didn't know any better, I mean, she'd be schizophrenic. I mean. Well, if this is a, if this is a traumagenic thing, it most likely happened because of trauma, which also caused dissociation of some sort, which could have produced some, some degree of dissociative amnesia, which, which we call missing yep. time. Someone's missing yep. time. Right. If, if it did cause dissociative amnesia, dissociation means we kind of, there's a partition formed in our brain somewhere. And that might mean that the part of her brain that knows that this is incorrect is starting to come to the surface and is causing more stress and more tension from the part that does believe that. For, for me, guys, I, I'm going to take the simplest route. I'm going to say, no, it's a story. And Maslow's hierarchy, you know, I'm a firm believer that people wedge themselves into groups. And if you're in a crazy group that owns tigers, you get more tigers. If you're in a crazy group that believes they've been abducted by UFOs, you, your stuff has to get sexier. I was on the ship at two, not at 20. They loved me and they grew me to be their person. I, I think it's back to Mark. You had the best line ever. When you have tigers, there's no normal. When you yeah. believe you're abducted by UFOs, your normal is different than my normal. Right. And, and here's how she's skewing that idea is she says, you know, I think of them as a different race. They may be a different species. My children... So she's talking about aliens. She's been asked about aliens in this, and she says, well, I think of them as a different race. She's saying aliens, what you say is aliens, they're not really aliens. They're just like, you know, people from another country, okay? And then she says, you know, they may be a different species, but she, she's saying that they're, they're, they're not really that. She says, my children are Anglo-Dutch. They're hybrids. So, so and my guess is, you know, with, with, with you know, Uncle Derek on, on the polygraph there. <laughs> I reckon if I've got Uncle Derek on the polygraph and, and I've managed to skew the idea of what is an alien, I think I can pass the polygraph, a lie detector test, at least three times. Oh, we can show you how to do that. That's not a problem. <laughs> I've got kidding. something for you. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Exactly how to do that. All right, good. Anybody else? I wouldn't have believed we would get this much out of this. This is fun. I wouldn't either. I was completely getting ready to dismiss the whole thing. I thought we were going to, as we all thought, this is going to be 20 minutes in and out. It's just too much fun. Do you have pot alien children? Yes. You claim to be the mother of three hybrid children. Humalians. Yes. So how were they conceived? They were conceived in the usual way. Both the human father and I probably have some alien DNA already in us. And then at about 12 weeks, I was taken up into the spaceship again. I have a clear memory of this. So that's where you had sex too, wasn't yes. it? In the spaceship? Yes. Yes. So, so you... A lot you of people might make a joke about the no, wild you club. Can... <laughs> <laughs> All the children were conceived on the spaceship? Yes. Did you have any say in that? No. No, and you know, I'm making the best of this story and I'm trying to be lighthearted about it because I've been through my grieving process and I still have days I'm upset about it and I miss the children. So I say they were kind to me and they consented and I want to defend the race because I feel part, almost part of them as if they're family. Where did you give birth? Well, the, the, they were taken from my uterus in the spaceship, but here I had to have DNCs and there was no Curious. Yes. Um, so and doctors so, were confused every time. So they, they they removed the babies here. No, they removed the babies in there. 
And then you had to, and then you had to go to hospital to have a bit of treatment. Well, I did. Yes, I could. So did so you you only went to a three month term or something like that. The, the longest baby? one was five months, and then the babies yeah. were put into some sort of test, some sort of humidity crit or something, something in space. Yeah, they've got way more advanced medical technology than we do. There's no question about that. But here I would have an ultrasound and there would be a fetus on the ultrasound, and I would have positive pregnancy tests, and then suddenly the baby would be gone without any evidence of that. <laughs> but if you grief. carried a baby for five months, someone must have noticed you were pregnant. Oh no, I went to a doctor and it was confirmed that. I was pregnant. Where was your husband? Um, your earth husband. I was divorced by you the were divorced stage. By yes. Okay. All right. Everybody good? Polygraph. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Polygraph. Let's move along. I'm sorry. Polygraph. Much like any parent separated from their child here on earth, and her face beams when she talks of them. I've got a girl called Claire, and then a boy called Jude, and then another boy called Heath. And then Claire has married another, for want of another word, Humalian on you know, in their society, and his name's Gabriel. They obviously have grey names, but I had to give them some names. <laughs> and she has a, a baby called Amelia. They look quite human, only small. So my daughter would be quite tiny. So that's not really my genes, that would be the grey genes. She looks like a normal woman, she's just got small boobs. Well, Greg, what do you got? Well, the, the weirdest of, out of all that, I see a disgust signal in the middle of all that. If you noticed, it's a one standout piece of body language. She's, I have to call him something that disgust that's harder for me and you mm. to do. And it may, it may or may not be disgust it may, because women use their nose to communicate. It may be a way to bond in a way that we typically don't. Otherwise, why disgust around I have to call them something? And the, I have to call them something it's not like she just coined this phrase. I guarantee you this is something she's used before, humalian, humalian, humalian. Again, she's doing the, her body's getting smaller and decreasing target size as she's telling her story. Her posture's shifting constantly. And it's just an outlandish tale is what I see. I don't, I don't maybe there's trauma that generated it, but I'm, I'm progressively thinking it's an outlandish tale. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so that disgust gesture, I often see that as, as smelling the rat of your own lie sometimes. It's, it's disgust at your poor performance of telling the story. It's like, oh, I'm so bad at this. Or, or it's like, it's, like it's, it's your unconscious mind just going, you're lying. What are you doing? Like, why, have you, why have you brought me here to do this? This is really, this is really annoying for me. Can we not get the hell out of here? Yeah. So, so I think, you know, there may be some elements of that, but look, the rea again, like, I'm, pretty smart. I'm lost in the story. I'm kind of lost. It's like the first name she says has an upward intonation. Like she's saying, is, is that a good name? Is that, do you buy that name? Is that all right? And then she must have got some signal back from the interviewer that says, yeah, yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> We'll go with that because the rest of the names are downward intonations. Like she goes, okay, you bought the first name. I'm giving you the second. I'm giving you the third. <laughs> yeah. And now, oh God, I've never gone this far. Hang on. Uh, I'm going to have to make some stuff up. Oh no, I hate this. I hate my job. I hate my job making. I think that's what happens. I yeah, wonder if she asked again, if she asked her their names again, if she would remember what she said. You'd say, well, I made those up. They're just, they have gray names and they're, okay. you know. That's exactly where I'm going. That's yeah. exactly where yeah. I'm going. No, that's cool. But uh, and again, I think she's trying to blow past this too because she's getting smaller. She's moving. She's got. She's totally guarding that neck and throat. Yeah. She's totally. I, it's like she's getting ready to be hit by something. She's totally making herself smaller. I think she's trying to get past this because again, I don't think this part of it. She may, it may be in her book or whatever, but I don't think she was ready for that. And I think maybe, and I think that thing about she had, a, you know, being the grandmother, she hasn't said that yet. But when she says she had a kid too or whatever, I think that just jumped out. I, I think she's, as she's trying to add her qualifiers to it to make it more believable, it's just, and she had a kid. You know, it's look at her. She's jumping all, she's squishing all over the place. She can't sit still. So I think that's, I think that kind of just jumped out. And she's, and she's like, oh, and I got, now what? You know? Move along, stupid. Move along. I think that's what her other part of her brain is saying, trying to get her out of the mess. We've seen that. Everybody's seen. You know, we've oh, yeah. Seen yeah. That. Yep. The wiggling to, out, to get out of the chair, looking for yeah. the door. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Chase, what do you got? Totally agree with you. I was watching this earlier today, and I saw the same behavior. She, that was something like, they're buying this. I'm going to throw in an extra detail this time. 
<laughs> and you heard her from the beginning, this confirmation glances. Oh, yeah. yeah. The Conf- request for approval, Greg calls it. Yeah. yeah. And when they say she beamed, when she mentioned her children, her face lit up. That didn't happen. <laughs> no. True facial yeah. expressions fade off of the face. False facial expressions. We've got four of the top in the world here. False facial expressions stop. They yes. show up and they disappear. Because there's no energy behind keeping the Eggman talks about that, how there's nothing yep. keeping those things stuck there. It's just there and then gone. Another thing is, there's a guy named Doc Watson. I think I've heard you guys, uh, I've told you guys about him. He's a guitar player. He's my dad's best friend. Grew up with him. He's a blind guy. He was blind. Uh, it was my dad's age. I didn't grow up with him, but I grew up and he was there all the time. And um, when he would smile, and I could tell when we'd be telling jokes and things, he would say something was funny. But when he really didn't think it was funny, his smile would leave really quickly. Because he's never seen anybody, he doesn't know to, to like gradually back that thing right. down. He would just smile real big and all of a sudden it'd be gone. You know, so but there there's uh, are ways around that I'm sure in in the world of the blind. But in that in that situation, it would just go quickly. And I remember as a kid thinking, why is that happening? Come to find out later on what we just talked about. So I, and I think that's I think that's I think you're right, Chase. I think that's what's going on there. And she's just trying to like blow right past it as she's as she's slipping down the hill, you know, trying to catch herself, you know. Greg, what do you got? Anything else? No, no, that, that's all of that movement, all of that shrinking, all of that's not normal posturing. You know, if I, you, you talk about your children, you're proud. You're talking about your children. You uncover your throat. It's one of those things, one of those moments of pride. If I ask you about your kids, everyone on here would raise your chin as you talk, not slump away like a dog in a fight, right? With your chin over your throat. There's one more thing that's not here anywhere, pretty much is when we talk about truthful things that are emotional or real or fun or sad, our eye muscles move as we're saying the words. If, you're talking about my, if I'm talking about my kids, I'm, I'm going to say, I've got two kids, and you're going to see the small movements in the eye muscles. You'll see squinting and uh, facial expressions that match it. She's obviously good at narrating with her body. She says, I'm in this big round room, and then nothing else is narrated for the rest of the thing. And she grabs the crib and looks over the crib. Right. And yeah. It doesn't because, narrate anything else. But those themselves are qualifiers as you're adding to, you have to create that picture in your mind. When I'm teaching entrepreneurs how to pitch, I say, you've got to build this picture in your mind that they can pop out and put in somebody else's head. That's what she's doing. Because even when they describe their business, I have them do specific things. Mark knows about that. I have them do specific things so it builds that picture in their mind. That's what she's doing. She's using that. Those are quali- those are qualifiers, in other words, right out of the gate as she's starting to tell it. She's building this story, this picture for you to take with you and give somebody else if need be. That's but what she's happened. told. She has told that story so many times. She's got it down to a pantomime kind of thing. But when she gets to a hard question about how many kids she has and what their names are, and now she's got to kind of yeah. reach back and pull it out. That's should have gone back to that. Have any of that kind of stuff going? Yeah, she should have gone. She should have asked. What the, what's that kid's name? What's the I would kid's have loved name? that. It was. Oh. Uh, you can see the deer in the headlights look. I guess. Yeah, yeah. See, that's our TV show right We're there. Talking, doing this. Let us know what their what are their gray names. We would love to hear those. Yeah, I would love to hear that because she's right. going to make up some slee stack kind of sounding stuff. Then all she's got to do is say, "Wait a minute, I'm going to write those down. What were they again?" <laughs> And she's like, oh, you wouldn't be able to pronounce them. I can hear coming out in you know, it. Ah, that's good. You're that's right. An age-old one, you know. Way. Well, I think there's a huge difference as well between the first names that she comes up with and then the last one, which is Gabriel, which is, uh, you know, obviously <laughs> has, a, has a biblical connotation to it. My guess is, is that comes right from her unconscious and, and, and the Christian upbringing. Uh, that she, she grabs onto something iconic, whereas the other names are kind of quite ordinary. You know, they're not so extraordinary. And then suddenly it's like, and then they named one after an angel. Yeah, the biggie. Yeah. So. Much like any parent separated from their child here on earth, and her face beams when she talks of them. I've got a girl called Claire and then a boy called Jude, and then another boy called Heath. And then Claire has married another, for want of another word, Humalian on, you know, in their society, and his name's Gabriel. They obviously have grey names, but I had to give them some names. (laughs) And she has a, a baby called Amelia. They look quite human, only small. So my daughter would be quite tiny 
So that's not really my genes, that would be the grey genes. She looks like a normal woman, she's just got small boobs. All right, everybody good? Good. All right, here we go. Do you have some proof? Do you have a Still selfie? Still over the net. Do you have a selfie? <laughs> <laughs> I would love a selfie. I would love my children to stand here and meet you. Yeah. But... How do you talk to them? Both. I can speak to them telepathically or audibly because they're human as well. So they can speak English? Yes, they can. And have you only seen them this once? Yeah, well, yeah. Then I remember. That was in response to me basically chucking a little tanty in my head. You know, I, this is not fair. I'm sick of this. I want answers. I, I want to know why, where I went last night and why. And, and I want to meet my children. And, you know, within a short time of, of thinking that and, and, and crying for them, um, I was taken and I got to meet them and I got to hug them. And, they, you know, they were physical beings that I could touch. And it was, I, 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 I tear up just thinking about it. It was very emotional time all right chase go ahead i would like to meet a human who describes their children as physical beings <laughs> yeah man you just did <laughs> boom yeah you yeah you saw her. even if well, you I, keep tigers yeah. nobody does that <laughs> and and it's just more selling to the story yeah the reaction when she says do you talk to them she's like holy crap what am I, how am I going to respond to this? In my head. You yeah. shock a little bit, freeze, the body language stops, then a break in eye contact, which is not accessing. It's like a, a right. I, need to, I need to do something. Invasive. Yeah. And yeah. I, this was the most deceptive to me, the most deceptive piece of the entire video. And if I was to give this one clip a score of deception, it would be 100%. Yeah. I, I, Chase, I couldn't agree with you more. A few things. So she says, just thinking about them makes me emotional and looks down into her left, which I love <laughs> because that's exactly the opposite of emotion. That's an internal conversation. So I'm, I'm going over and I'm going, uh, 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 what do I say next? Yeah. When people become emotional about a story, if you ask me about the most traumatic moment of my life, I'm going to be emotional even if I don't cry. You're going to see my head tilt. You're going to hear voice and language associated with that not a rambling diatribe of mixed words <laughs> about physical beings and now they don't just have telepathy but they have telepathy attached to long distance so she can rant in her head and they show up suddenly this is getting more and more <laughs> of a story guys this is a story that she's created and she's probably going to get more details for her book out of this interview because this thing she had thought of I'm with you, Chase. There's no methodical process-driven thing here. She's just throwing out junk to see what will stick. And I think if there's one thing that shows the, the reason that this could be traumagenic is how she describes, I want to see my kids. I miss those kids. I wanted to meet those. I wanted to meet my kids. But no emotion. No emotion when she does it. Right. That's and she the calls them the kids. Mm -hmm. You know. But it's, again, I see, her, I see her in panic mode here. She's trying to get out of this. She's trying to get out as quick as she can. It's almost like, I'll see y'all later on, man. Take it easy. Yeah. She's like scooching away from her and getting smaller. The whole thing says, you know, she's in a panic to me. She continues to say it was an emotional time. Doesn't describe crying on the couch. Doesn't describe overeating or crying at her friend's house or calling friends. She didn't say it was an emotional experience. Right. She says it was an emotional time. It's a descriptor, not a not not an explanation, right? And when you use those kind of descriptors, that's storytelling because you're not thinking about how it felt. If I ask you about Sears School, Chase, and I say, "Tell me about Sears School," you won't say, "What well, was an emotional time?" No, <laughs> yeah, although it was, I guarantee you. Right. You're going to remember specific emotions you felt: anger, remorse fear, whatever it is, even if you say emotional and you're talking in emotional language, you're not going to say, again, your body is going to behave a certain way. Your head is going to drift down into your right. Your eyes are going to drag your big lunk of dead flesh over to the right. And your whole body is going to change posture. Her posture is too busy doing that. Some kind here's of thing. one thing. Here's one thing Chase isn't going to do when he describes Sears School. He's not going to go, well, I remember the day when I first opened the door and looked around. <laughs> Bad actors who haven't been in that situation mime out the yes. actions. Good actors 
um, don't avoid the emotion. They dive into the emotion and they go through the emotion. Bad actors stay away from the emotion and they, and they move away from the emotion by trying to show us the actions that, that happened. And that's what we're seeing with her is we see a lot of actions around it and we don't see her dive into the, the emotion. Now we could say, okay, well, there could be trauma there. She's avoiding that or she's sublimated the trauma into uh, a story. So we could give her the benefit of the doubt around that if we wanted to say, you know, she's not opportunist and she's not just trying to sell, That's a, fair. sell yeah. a book, okay? Uh, the other thing that I'd, I'd like to say about this is, is really about good ways of interviewing people for people who are thinking, well, how can I get the truth out of people? One of the best things you can do is just shut up and say nothing. And here, the interviewer gets a moment because... Because she says, I think she says something like, I would like you to meet them, but... And stops. And the interviewer, the interviewer dives in there because it's dead air and goes, okay, let's get another question in. The best thing that a good interviewer would have done there in terms of trying to get the, the truth is to just say nothing and let her fill the space of but. And if she doesn't fill it, say, but what? Tell me. Tell me what, what do you want to say? Because I think there was something interesting going to happen after that, but. Yeah, I think they had just a short amount of time to talk to her. They got somebody's cousin or brother or a friend of somebody's from work who knew how to do, who had the, the uh, you know, the lie detector app. You know, it's just the whole thing just is this rinky dink. From, but of course, look what they're talking about. How can you take it that seriously? But I want to, because I want to go, what, what, if, we had, what if we'd come on here and said, you know what? I believe her. You know, I see things like this that 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 I've seen everything truthful. That would be one thing, but it just doesn't. No. How can you, you know, and, and people can believe a lot of things in their head and tell you what is their truth. That's not even going on here. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's do this. Let's, let's throw it around the room. We'll kind of give a 15, 20 second wrap up of what we think is going on, what we think's happened, and then. Uh, well, bring it to a close. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, I think if we want to give her the benefit of the doubt, then we're looking at somebody with trauma. If we don't want to do that, then we're looking at somebody who's written a book and they'd like to sell it. Okay, Chase? Yeah, I think we're seeing somebody here who is dealing with feeling outcast and feeling rejected from social circles, has made up a story for whatever reason, and has, has written a book about it. And this book is designed to bring her back into those circles. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons that we see this, this sign. And one thing I'd love for everybody to do is just one to a hundred. What's the percentage of truth indicators that you saw in this story? Mm. Okay, Greg. Yeah. So for me, like both of you, I see indicators of deception, people telling a story usually have a story that they develop over time. And they remember, this is a war story thing, right? You keep injecting new material. When you're injecting that new material, you get fight or flight. She's squirming. She's dancing. She's trying to get away. I think it's simply when she was 10 or 12 or 20 or some point in her life, she started telling a story. And I think that story has grown and grown and grown and grown. I'd love to know more about when this first happened or if she had an epiphany in 1992 or when it actually occurred. If, if I were... Chase, if you're asking me, 10 to 15%, right? 10 to 15% of what she said is true. Now, that doesn't mean that she's just an outright liar. She's telling a story to me. Yeah. Okay. I think it's one of those things where she's retired from being a nurse, and that's who she was. That was her identity. And now she's the lady who has humalians. You know, she said, that's, who she, that's her identity now. Because the other one's been taken away for whatever reason. She doesn't look like she's old enough to retire, but maybe she is or something. But for some reason, she's not there and doesn't have that group because she kept talking about groups and people and us and we. And I think that's, that's who she is now. That's who she's become with that. And I think on a, the, the truth that we're seeing this, I want to give it about, um, I'm going to say 9%. I'm going below 10%. <laughs> yeah, truth indicators. Well, she so, gave her name. <laughs> That's true. That's, there you go. There's 9%. So, Mark, what percentage do you give it? 
I mean, z- z- zero honesty around around being abducted by actual e- extraterrestrials. I think she feels she's been quite honest about giving birth to hybrids. I think that's. <laughs> I think she believes that. And if you uh, and so it's it's either an intellectual skewing of of that, and okay. so it, it really comes down to what does she believe? I think she believes that it's okay to tell us a story uh, where she skews the nature of that story. She reframes it. So if we bring this back up one level, right, for a second, let's forget any kind of conjecture about she's crazy or she's this or she's that. For me, the reason I said 10 to 15% is because she was squirming around like a worm on a griddle most of the time. There, was only, there were only a couple of moments where she actually stopped and had kind of sane body language that made me think, okay, I want to talk to this woman. If I had a prisoner sitting across the table from me and they were squirming around as much as she is, I would not believe a word they said during the time. And so for me, if we just take into account, I agree, she could be, it could be traumagenic. And if it is, then we have a mental, a mental health issue, right? <laughs> Versus just somebody who is BSing and making stuff up. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I, I go with 10% on, on my end as well. Okay, cool. This is well, I, think this, I think this is a good one. I think it's a, and, and let's try to find another one, to, to uh, something like this to interject in between our, all of our serious stuff, you know. Let's move on. We'll do find something else. All right, so I think that went well. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, that was fun. A lot more than I expected. Fun. Well, you know what? The worst thing is to be the polygrapher we just took apart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Oh bless his heart. All right. Oh, uh, All right.